Okay, so before we start, uh, um, so I was informed that yesterday there was a meeting, there, there was a visit to CISA, right? And only six people showed up. Since we are uh, uh, organizing uh, uh, the shuttle bus uh, from here to there, if you don't plan to go, please uh, let uh, uh, Angelo Rosa know, so that uh, if shuttle buses are not needed, uh, we will uh, reduce. Uh, I mean, this is a service uh, that if it's not used, uh, it's, um, it's better not. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So after the lecture, we are going to have uh, a group photo. So don't uh, leave. And, uh, and now we can uh, start with the last uh, lecture of uh, recording in progress. Right. Joshua. Thank you, Matteo. And today will be the last lecture, but not my last class period with you. Tomorrow we will be online, or at least I will be online. You'll be here in person, and I'll be doing some work on a laboratory. Matteo, are we? Are they going to be in this room or the other room? The, to, other, room. the other room. So. The format tomorrow, I'll be on the screen because I need to travel back and need to be closer to the airport, but I will be there for that morning, go over the prior laboratory, explain some of the concepts. All of you should have uh, seen in Slack, there is a Dropbox file request that I made, so each one of you should do that, and you should also see, because if it says viralecologylab.py, NB or whatever it is you're going to put it as your name, that doesn't help me. Last name, underscore, first name, and then the lab, and then you can put the, the appendix of the file suffix. So make sure that I can actually identify that there's someone there. I have a record that each one of you who is taking this, and you know who you are, who take it for a grade. It's only, am I right, Matteo, that it's just the folks who are taking it for a grade that need to submit this document, right? So please uh, find that on Slack and deposit it. And then tomorrow I will give out uh, a new laboratory. I'll probably post it this evening in case you want to look at it first. And I've already gone over with Jacopo a little bit, so he's aware of what's going to go on. So working groups together and Jacopo and I together with Matteo will be able to manage kind of helping you get through. I will also post the, the solutions to that one. So make sure that you have a copy of it and then you can look at it at your own pace so that you have a reference for how these things work. Okay, so what I wanted to do today was to wrap up the arc of this epidemics laboratory and just to kind of keep everyone on the same page. On Monday, I gave a large overview of some of the principles underlying efforts to intervene, these mathematical principles that we have to think of as guides, but there shouldn't be sacrosanct because we see they have some flaws. And so I also tried to explain on Monday what it is that folks do, what a theorist in theory, what can theory do, what do theorists do to intervene. And then um, yesterday I tried to reassert these foundations and then begin the process of examining uh, what happens when you change the assumptions. Right, so starting with standard SIR-like models and even SI models with uh, waning immunity, and then talk about, about heterogeneity. I haven't wrapped up the heterogeneity, so I want to spend a few more minutes starting today, and I'm intending to do a few things today so you all know what's coming. I'm going to try to wrap up this heterogeneity section. Heterogeneity. And then I will bridge, and it turns out there's an interesting link here between heterogeneity and behavior, and then I will, in some sense, return to one of the first themes that I talked about with these generation intervals, and <clears throat> hopefully this, we're continuing learning something new, there'll be some new stuff here, I'll start with some old stuff, but then teach you something new here at the end that allows you to see what we did at first in a new light. Okay, so that's the game plan today, and no slides, it'll just be the board work and hopefully interactive. So. To start with heterogeneity, I want to recall that I talked about a case in which we could imagine viewing a population in terms of 
some different vulnerability to infection. And maybe it was like this, some exponential, maybe it was like this, so there's a modal, but there was some variation. Right? And what you saw is that that fundamentally changed the dynamic so that we ended up changing the order going from a beta SI kind of force of infection to beta SI squared in the case of exponential, beta S, no, beta I S squared, excuse me, in the case of an exponential, and then obviously in more generalized cases, we don't necessarily have a closed form, but it changes the nonlinearity, and also we saw that this distribution itself was sculpted. So I want to, I kind of rushed it a little bit at the end. I want to talk just a bit more about the sculpting in one case, and then I'll move on to behavior, because right, I just wanted to wrap up that idea. So to recall, if I have a set of these classes, each one is encountering infectious individuals, but we're going to scale the infection rate by this vulnerability parameter. So less vulnerable, less likely to be infected, more vulnerable, more likely to be infected. You already see, and we went through yesterday, why this leads to actually, and I don't know if Jacopo is in the audience, but almost something like a Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection, which you may or may not have heard about. But the mean changes directly portion of the variance. Right? If there's no variance, there's no change because everything is the same, so we can't change the mean. We're just reducing the number. But the more variance mean there's more things on the right to pull out faster. The more variance there is, the faster actually the mean moves. So we get something like this. Hey, we got something like this. Right? We went through that yesterday where we have the accumulation of all these different infection classes moving into the infected, of the septal class moving into the infected, and then these recover, and that was the model. Okay. So we went over this yesterday. I just want to explain what happens to each one of these categories. And I want to make a particular claim that I'll try to write here, that if we start with an exponential, here's S, here's epsilon, and we have something like e to the minus epsilon, and I'll start with the characteristic value 1. So yes, I could have some mean that is different than 1, but initially it's exponential. My claim is that over time what this sculpting is doing is continuing to move it, but always retaining the shape. Okay, so it continues to have this section here, and we're just moving it down and to the left. And I'm saying down and not just sideways in some ways, because I'm trying to say that we're actually depleting. And if we were to take the integral of s of epsilon d epsilon, we would get the total number of susceptibles left, which is less than 1. So I'm really trying to say this is sculpting, and I'm using that diagonal intentionally. So let me actually go through and then do that, looking again at this distribution and focusing on a particular class, right? Because in some sense, and this is a big caveat which I'll just mention before I make the transition, this isn't formally speaking, although we have a structured population, we don't have any way in this model yet for things to move across the epsilons. We're just decreasing this category. So each one is really moving independently although they're coupled by the fact that the strength of how fast they're depleted is connected by all. Right? Okay. So because of that, we can actually think in that particular category, if this was our focal epsilon, minus beta s of epsilon i, we can think of just taking this derivative and what we see, and I think you can see how this is going to happen, that we are going to have something which then if I 
S of epsilon is some S0 of epsilon, e to the minus beta epsilon, and I'll actually write epsilon, I should write it this way. This is some force of infection, cumulative force of infection over time. Does everyone see that? Each one, we can do this for any value of epsilon, right? It would apply to any. Just saying whatever the initial value was, it's going to exponentially decrease because you can see that whatever this rate is, is a proportion to its own value. So it has an ex characteristic exponential shape, and they all share this common cumulative force of infection. And because they all share the common value, I could immediately just replace that epsilon with epsilon prime. And find for a different value. Now my claim is that this sculpting process has an interesting feature depending on what the distribution is. And this allows me to introduce the eigen distribution concept here of sculpting for heterogeneity without necessarily using such a complicated distribution. So that's my caveat. So I'm going to do this because you can get the concept, but then I have to tell you at the end what other things have this property, right? So you can see that this one is being sculpted downwards, but I could have chosen another arbitrary epsilon prime there or epsilon prime there, and they're each being sculpted. This one is being sculpted faster, a little bit less fast, even slower. Right? They're all facing this same force of infection. There's been the cumulative number of infections that's coupled, but they're seeing it differently because we're scaling the betas in some way. Therefore, if we take the ratio at some later time, we just take this ratio S at some T of epsilon divided by ST of epsilon prime, we're just going to have the ratio of these two things. But this ratio must be something like e to the minus epsilon minus epsilon prime over some epsilon characteristic. Right? Uh, whatever the prefactor was, I don't have to worry about it, it cancels out. We had these differences should be exponential at the start. And now you see we have something like e to the minus epsilon minus epsilon prime times some other integral beta i dt. Everyone see that? Because I'm just taking the ratios and this is shared so I can pull it out. Okay? Which means that this is just e to the minus epsilon minus epsilon prime times some funky thing. And if I set arbitrarily this characteristic value initially to be 1, we have 1 minus some force of infection up to time t. Am I still okay here at some point? Right. Good. I think so. So if I have that, you can now see that this is itself just some um, epsilon characteristic at time t. Just the inverse. Though I don't know why I have, I feel like something went wrong with my signs, but maybe not. But you can see that basically we preserve an exponential shape even though the characteristic value is changing. OK? The reason, again, is that each one of these is independent. 
with a rate that's proportional to its value, so we tend to get exponentials. If we start with an exponential, all we're doing is shifting the characteristic value, like the way I said, downwards and to the left, while retaining the same shape the whole time. Now, it's true that this does retain its shape, but not all things retain their shape. So if we started with something that looked flatter initially, this is going to start pulling down and actually look more and more exponential with time. If we have something that is gamma-like, it actually over time will stay gamma. Gamma stays gamma. And it turns out Gaussians stay mostly Gaussian. But I can't guarantee you uh, beyond the gammas and the exponentials that they will actually, and, and Gaussians that have narrow windows, that they actually are eigendistributions. So this thing can change the shape. It, so it's really sculpting. But in some cases, it's sculpting while retaining the shape. So we're miniaturizing the distribution along the way. OK? So the thing that I wanted to say here and just wrap up this section because I felt like I started it but I wanted to close it is that we often make this assumption of homogeneity in which all we're caring about is the number of individuals who are left through the epidemic infection process. And then we get these terms like herd immunity, susceptible depletion. It's all the, it's all driven, in some sense, by how many people are left. Here, these individuals are different. And heterogeneity can have interesting effects, particularly because it's drawing down individuals here more quickly than over there. And the consequence is, as you sculpt, or miniaturize, but really sculpt, then you can have the infection slow down in part because Conditional upon being left, you are less likely to have a high vulnerability. You're more likely to have a lower vulnerability. Has anyone here ever heard of mortality rate plateaus before? No one. OK, I'll just ask a question, and it helps to provide some context. So if you have a seven-day-old fly, you breed many flies and you track them and then some die every day. You look at a seven-day-old fly. And then you wait for a while and you had a large number of flies and you get some that last to 70 days. It turns out that if you start with a very large number of flies, about a million or so would do. You could get some that make it to 70. Now I ask you, if I have the seven-day-old fly, typical seven-day-old fly, and a 70-day-old fly, which one is more likely to make it one more day? The 7 or the 70? Everyone understands why? Anyone have a thought? Say, say again? 7. Seems more likely, right? It's a younger fly. Turns out the 70 day old fly is more likely to make it to 71 than the 7 day old fly is to make it to 8. Part of the reason, I think, is related to this. You can imagine that flies varied in how fit they were for all sorts of reasons, maybe because of some initial differences, or maybe even they had different amounts of food along the way. The ones that made it to 70, it turns out, are probably sitting on this side of the distribution. So if I think of this as some frailty distributions, if I'm too close to this side, the ones that are not that, that, that are frail have already gone away. And the ones that are less frail are not. You see this same effect in cars. Like if your car has made it to 20 years, probably make it to 21, whereas the two-year-old car can still break down probably likely before three light bulbs. It's sort of a generic feature of uh, aging. Uh, it doesn't always lead to a plateau or even a decrease. So there are cases in which, in fact, it does this strange thing where you're even better off. So usually it just slows down in terms of the rate rather than actually going lower. The reason why that happens is because the failure of this fly, the death of that fly, means that 
what are left are things that tend to be better off or more fit than those that have died. So you're selecting and sculpting a distribution. Here, you're sculpting a distribution, preferentially on one side, so that the ones that are left overall are less likely to be infected in the future which means that you don't necessarily have to go as low in terms of susceptible depletion. You're depleting susceptibility. In other words, you're depleting vulnerability at the same time as you're removing the numbers. You're changing the composition as well as the number of individuals. OK. Any questions about this? Because I wanted to just wrap up and just make this claim that it's possible that sculpting can preserve distributions, but also it can drive other distributions and attract them to it. Any other questions or any questions about that? OK, everyone's satisfied. If you want to read more, I'll maybe post the uh, paper that goes into all of this. But this really explains a lot about how things were discussed in terms of heterogeneity and herd immunity thresholds. This science paper from 2020 talking about how age and activity differences can lead to different kind of outcomes and why people became very cautious. And there was all this debate early on where people tried to make this inference of strength and then try to infer with size. What's interesting in these models is that the initial strength is exactly what you would have assumed from a standard model, as is the speed. So you make these inferences, but in fact, this sort of stuff only happens later once the sculpting unfolds. Right? So it's one of those things that initially, if you're trying to make inferences and why people had a lot of doubts, how many people would be infected by SARS-CoV-2, people were almost using their intuition about how important things like social networks and even things like heterogeneity were in terms of shaping the final size. OK. Good. Going to a race. And we've done that one. You can just, just look at that corner for the next hour to see how far we're doing it. You know. I know you're getting to the end of a long course. We're going to make it. We only have two more lectures today and two more tomorrow. You can do it. All right, I, I seem to be doing more work than you this morning. But so tomorrow, you can do more work than me. OK, I want to talk about behavior next. In these models, SIR-like models, we're often making an assumption that, again, the betas, these parameters, these transmission parameters and the recovery rates are not changing with time. So we have this feedback. We have some transmission rate beta. We have recovery rate gamma. But who amongst us behaved the same way in this whole pandemic? Mostly, I would say, the first approximation, no one. We're in this room. We're wearing masks. I, they're supposed to be open windows. They're not, but that's OK. It's a pretty big room. Right? We've made all these changes. And for a long time, we also even reduced the number of interactions we had. And remember in the class yesterday, I talked about beta as being the product of the number of infections number of interactions one has between the times is the probability that could lead to a transmission. So if I physically distance or social distance, then I'm reducing contacts. If I wear a mask, I improve ventilation, wash my hands, but mostly the masks and the ventilation and the filtering, then that reduces the probability that even if I'm close that there's an infectious contact. Right? So this is not changing in time. This presents challenges. So we have to just be very clear, this is epidemiology plus behavior equals, right, it is an open field. You will find just as many articles that say like 10 challenges in linking epidemiology and behavior as you do actual papers that make some progress, whether empirically, theoretically, and even more rarely, a combination. And whatever model we do, so I'm, what I'm going to explain today, in some sense, I've isolated the heterogeneity effect. And now I'm going to isolate the behavior effect. In the long run, I would love one day to come back a long time in the future. It's been a very long 10 days, so I need a break. 
But sometime in the future, maybe I would say talk about both, right? how to combine them. But I want to just explain each separately. Yes, well, uh, you could think that, um, I mean, say, people wearing masks or, uh, say, taking precautions have a smaller epsilon uh, in the heterogeneity framework uh, than people who are not uh, taking precautions, right? Um, in the sense that the infection rate for depends on behavior, right? Yes, absolutely. But the epsilon may itself be a function of behavior. Right, so there may be people, so there may be some intrinsic differences, and then we may even change our behavior. So I view it as there's likely intrinsic differences which specify way maybe our intrinsic epsilon is different. It could also be different vulnerabilities to infection, but to first order, let's say that it's largely driven by behavior. On top of that, what I'm about to say is that it could be, right, maybe you know, we did this model in which there was heterogeneity and that implicitly gave behavior, just made it fixed though. It could also be that beta is some function of time. And you often find in economist models they would just look for these externalities and say well beta f changes like this and that's what happens. Maybe this is because there was a lockdown so it's all external. So I want to talk about today is that somehow beta is a function of somehow what's going on. So I just want to there are different ways that we could play this game, and I'm going to play it in a slightly different way next. Right? And the way I want to begin to play this, and again, there are truly different ways, is I want to imagine somehow that the fact that there are infected people could negatively feed back to this rate of beta. The fact that there are recovered people could negatively feed back. I view this first negative feedback loop as short-term awareness. So if you can't read that, I wrote short-term. Short. Because there's a limited time where people are infectious or infected. If I somehow am aware of how many of such people are and that changes my behavior, that's in the short term. But I can view this feedback as long-term, and if I add them up, if I include the R, call it long-term. Because we could be in a state where there aren't that many infectious people around, but we remember that it was bad because of the accumulated impacts of the disease, and we keep changing our behavior. I'd say this room's behavior reflects more long-term awareness than it does short-term awareness. Actively speaking, right? I don't think you're aware of cases going on here, at this guest house, there have been a drop after this Omicron wave, and yet people are still retaining this behavior, even it's not exactly correlated to the level, right? There's not a sort of, probably you're going to wear a mask completely tied to what this is. But it can be both. So how would we include this awareness? We have this force of infection, which we've written like beta SI, and one way to do it, I'm going to introduce a few, would be to reduce this somehow. And obviously, any choice I make here, I just want to make sure you view this not in the same ways you view, I don't know, even something like F equals MA, a stat max set of equations. It is a set of equations that are meant to represent a phenomenological effect. And obviously, we still need to understand more about heterogeneity, how to see and include different factors, including individual differences. But you can imagine, let me see which one, I could do some short-term inhibition where maybe I discount this rate by some factor, or some long-term where I discount by the combined accumulation of cases. What I'm going to try to do next is explore the consequences. Again, not because I think things exactly like this happen, but because there are effects of things like this that are, in fact, I think, generic. So if that, I hope the difference is clear. I don't expect that this is precisely the right equations, but equations like this have effects that are shared, and we should understand them. What are the effects? 
for example, to things like whether or not the disease takes off. So what I want to explore in using this kind of model to start, is there an outbreak? What is the herd immunity threshold? What is the final size? Okay, so some basic questions. If we were to use a model like this, any questions about the framework here that we're going to use? You are adding beta? I'm multiplying beta SI by that term. Different classes of models. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I can play with one or the other. I just want to point out that when I include R, I'm going to call that a long-term awareness. Um, what is K? K is going to be some linearity exponent. So if K is 1, I'm assuming we reduce just by the proportion. So if, if we just discount our force of infection by 1 minus I plus R, whereas if K is 2 or 3 or 4, then we have an amplified effect. We have a nonlinear model. Okay, so it's, I just want to have some flexibility there to have the right functional form, but I can increase sort of the way that people react, how stiffly they react to these changes. Okay, good. So let's take a look and imagine that we start off at our disease-free equilibrium again, 1 comma 0, and again we have S plus I plus R is 1, so we only need to keep track of two things. And we can write down, and I think it's better to start with the long-term awareness, I can write S dot is minus beta SI, 1 minus I plus R to the K. I dot is beta SI, 1 minus I plus R to the K. Okay. No. Obviously, I need to have them recover. OK, so we have that kind of baseline model. But keep in mind that the recovered, or even i plus r, is just 1 minus s. Because s plus i plus r is 1, i plus r is 1 minus s. So this is keeping track in the same way when we try to figure out herd immunity thresholds. It's just keeping track of anyone who has been infected, whether now or in the past. The fraction of people who have been infected now in the past is just 1 minus the people who have not been infected. 1 minus 1 minus s is just s, right? Which means that if I assume, if I assume k is 1, so I just play with the linear model so I can do some calculations and then I can extrapolate, you end up getting a different kind of model. Which is equivalent to the model where we had an exponential distribution for heterogeneity, right? And we're back to changing the fundamental nonlinearities. So that in some sense, the behavior model, in this simplified sense, is changing the nonlinearity of the model. This obviously helps because we can do a number of things relatively quickly. We can already begin to see that when we have this linearized version and long-term awareness, then we can ask this first question, is there an outbreak? And is there an outbreak just means whether or not I dot is greater than zero, which really means, if I pull this out, Which means, because initially s is really 1, approximately 1, all this means is, as before, r0 greater than 1. Where again, r0, even in this awareness model, is beta over gamma. And part of the challenge here, and I'm going to try to explain the implications of all of this, 
is that when we have awareness at the start, this is a very small number. So the impacts of awareness don't kick in or influence whether or not the disease takes off. Which means that it has the same strength and in fact the speed is as before beta minus gamma. I just replace S squared with 1 and I get the speed. So I get the same strength and the same speed. Now, let's say you're working in public health intervention and you have gotten some data which is allowing you to measure the speed and then you deployed your epidemic intelligence service officers which are real things and some friends are such officers in the US and I'm sure they're equivalent here in Italy and other places and they go and try to figure out the time between the infector and infected to narrow down gamma right to get a sense of the generation interval from that they infer this strength and then they use these final size relationships and make predictions they are unaware that awareness is going to kick in and people are going to change their behavior later so now they might reach the same conclusion that it's going to take off, we're, you know, we're in trouble, we have this or not. The question will be, what value of the final size will they predict? And if there's awareness, will that number differ? So far, it has had no effect. Okay. I'm assuming you're all following me, either in rapt attention or in glazed attention. One of the two, but maybe, uh, maybe rapt attention. I'm betting on rapt. Okay, good. So how do we figure out a few things? First of all, what's the herd immunity threshold? That we can just read off. The herd immunity threshold is when S is equal 1 over R naught. Oh, that's just like before. To the 1 half power. Let's think about it. In a traditional model, if R naught was 4, we'd have to have S go down to one-fourth before the disease would start to slow down. Which means 75% of the people would have to be infected. Before, and that's a lot. And there'll be overshoot. Here it says, no, no, no. We only have to get down to one-half. So the disease starts slowing down well before it would in the absence of awareness. Awareness has kicked in and slowed down this disease in the same way we would have reached these conclusions for the heterogeneous model. So already our predictions about how fast this thing is taking off might be the same initially, but they would start to diverge. And I will, I'm going to give you these clues and then make the graph in a, in a moment. So it's also populate, so we did this one, same. Speed and strength are the same, different herd immunity threshold. And what is the final size? And I think, can I erase this right here below it? That way I can keep all the answers a little bit closer. Does anyone need this piece? No. Okay. Good. Okay. So we can do the same trick as before and write di ds is equal to minus 1 minus gamma over beta s squared plus which means that I can write I is equal to minus s minus gamma over beta s plus some constant if I move it to the other side and I integrate Okay. Initially, I was 0, S was 1, which means we should replace this with 1 plus 1 over R naught. Everyone following? Which means then at the final time, so this is how we anchored it, but we're interested in a different condition when the disease is out, I is zero, and S infinity is unknown. Right? We're trying to find the final size of the outbreak. In which case, we again have zero, 
But now we have something a little bit different. I'm going to move this to the other side and write s infinity minus 1 equals, let's see if I can get this right, s infinity minus 1 equals 1 over r naught, 1 minus 1 over s infinity. Which means, this is the same as writing 1 over r naught, s infinity minus 1 over s infinity. I just move that around. And you see the s infinities minus 1 cancel on both sides, which means that the final size is just 1 over r naught. This previously was the herd immunity threshold. That's nice. I've just shown that when we have this feedback, long-term awareness, that for every strength, the awareness model must be less in terms of the final size than the model without awareness. Because the model without awareness got to this point and then overshot. Here, this is its terminal point. Okay, good. I'm going to erase this section and just try to fill in a little bit more so I can wrap up this idea. So what have I showed you here using this kind of model framework? What I've showed you is that if we have, I'm going to do two things. I might even skip this other part of this derivation. I'm not that excited by it right now. And I'll move to one more thing. What I've showed you is twofold. Here's R0. Here's 1. Here's outbreak size. Outbreak which is 1 minus s infinity. Because s infinity, people not infected, 1 minus s infinity is anyone who's been infected. And before, if this is 1, 1 half, here's 2, here's 3, here's 4, this is how it's going to look with this long-term awareness model. This was the herd immunity threshold, but that's the final size. And this is how it's going to look for a standard model. Okay. And if I were to increase that value of k, I can't give you a closed solution. But the more that people respond in this way, this is k equals 1, long term k greater than 1, these can have this kind of effect the more that they're responding to it, which means you see there's a gap, right? Here's this little gap. And that little gap might not be so little, depending on the value. It could be quite big. Why or when or where did that gap show up? If we looked at time, and we looked, for example, at the cumulative infections, in other words, I plus R, in a standard model, we would get this. And it would, obviously, this has to always go up because I'm adding things together. right? So we moved into the category. It's always going up. And I hope I have one other chalk color. Good. This is standard. The point of what I'm trying to tell you and why this tends to matter a lot, is that what's going to happen in the awareness model is that initially they're going to look the same. Later they'll start to diverge. So you will tend to find, this is like the long-term awareness model, this final size, which now I'm plotting here if I change or not, this becomes the extent to which the public health authorities
overstate the potential size of the epidemic. Because they can't necessarily see how much feedback there's going to be later on, even without external policy drivers. And for the most part, predictions on outbreak sizes from these conventional final size relationships from the mean field tend to overstate the size of epidemics. And what you can see is even if you disagree with me on my particular form, the consequence of an awareness model is it tends to have the same conditions here, but because you miss negative feedback later on, generically speaking, if we don't take that into account, we overpredict the size of the epidemic. Okay? Now, if there's short term awareness, the effects are going to be smaller insofar as I use this particular, I've even erased it, up the particular term where I do 1 minus i, in part because the prevalence of a disease tends to be a very small fraction of the population. But if that somehow is magnified or I constrain it, there's nothing to say that in the short term I can be very aware and even a small percentage can lead to a big effect. So it's clear this model is a bit too simplified because it doesn't necessarily scale with the maximum prevalence. These are the two ideas I wanted to get to in this first part of the behavior section. Any questions about these? Awareness that has a negative feedback tends to change long-term outcomes, but in doing so, the near-term tends to be the same, which leads to, generically speaking, potential for predictions that are actually higher than what end up being observed. Question, or I'm going to move on. Yes. Uh, you didn't draw the short time effect uh, on the cumulative infection. Yes, what? it's going to be over there. The long term has a much greater effect than does the short term. Okay, even in long, at long time, they are still. So if I had a third color, it would go mm. over like that. But they would still be better than the standard ones. Correct. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Now I'm going to erase all of this. Is that all right? Fine. So I'm going to keep that diagram up there because I'm going to modify it a little bit here at the end. And I have one more vignette and then I'll switch to the generation interval concepts. We'll see how we're doing. Good. OK. So I've shown you this kind of model. But I'm now going to show a slightly different one. And to do this, I'm going to make one slight modification that gets things, unfortunately, a little bit closer to some realities where I'm now going to be explicit about the fatality of the disease. And there are even some ways I thought I was going to include it today. I just didn't quite have enough time, and there's not enough time in these lectures, to talk about some other features having to do with asymptomatic and symptomatic. But clearly, with SARS-CoV-2, we have an asymptomatic route. And there's a lot of discussion about long COVID and other effects that aren't just related uh, to severe cases. Nonetheless. There are cases that can sometimes lead to fatalities. And that's evident. And that fatality index on a population as a whole can vary. Remember, we talked about the infection fatality rate versus the case fatality rate. And the infection fatality rate, which I'll write here as F, says the probability that someone who's infected ends up having this fatal outcome, right? so that there's a death as an outcome. For SARS-CoV-2, as a population a whole, a little bit less than 1% is probably appropriate. It can be, and obviously, strong. It is strongly varying with age. Strongly. So you have 70 per, probably 75 plus fatality rates, 8 to 10%. That's very high. It drops down to very much lower than 1%, not just 0.1%, but even lower for people your age. 
Yes, there are comorbidities and, and co-indicators and all such a, so many other indicators that might relate, but the fundamental one is age. I can't add all those features into this model. What I want to do is simply add this component and ask the question, if awareness of fatalities, and really I'm going to actually put awareness of this. Awareness of new fatalities changes our behavior. Because again, I want to go back to something that I hearkened to in the early lecture. We haven't had all these fundamental changes in behavior and the way we're operating society because of cases alone. Right? If we did, then the seasonal beta coronaviruses every year, we'd totally shut down site. We don't do that. The consequences are because of the severe outcomes. So I want to link it to the severe outcomes. And ask the question, in this kind of model, does something else happen? So I, what I'm trying to do in these lectures is introduce concepts in hopefully the simplest way possible. And there's some new things that happen with SARS-CoV-2 because in some sense, if you believe everything that I've said the last couple days as being a reflection of reality, then you would say that, well, when we measure these strengths and, and speed, we get something about final size outcomes. And again, with heterogeneity or with behavior, we might be wrong, but that fundamental concept of a disease going through, going up and down, has still remained. Right? Is everyone following my logic? That it's just changing how high the peak was, or when it hit, or how long it lasted, but fundamentally we get an up and down cycle. That's it. It goes up and it goes down and it looks relatively symmetric and relatively smooth. So now I want to ask if we had a different kind of model. And you may be frustrated because every time I make a new change, let me just figure, finish this out, I don't keep the old ones because I view these as different factors. They're the things you should be aware of when you're actually building these models. And how to combine them is still an open question. So let me just write down this and I'll take the question. Yeah, so, I, so I'm going to go back and forget, in some sense, everything I just told you about heterogeneity and blah, 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 because I want to put in awareness in a slightly different place. I'm going to call this incident of new death delta of t. Otherwise, it's a standard SIR model. I'm just making explicit that we're going to split recovered individuals into those who recover and not just remove, but recovered and fatalities. Yes, the question in the back. If you could yell it out, because otherwise we need the mic and I can repeat it. Yeah, my question is, uh, now that you mentioned that the shape on the previous models all look the same, my question is if there is a, well, I have not studied it, so uh, my question is if I, it's possible to recognize between the different models, or we could say, I mean, in, empirically we see what is happening and we want to say it's this model or this other model, it's a possibility of differentiating between the models, or we could just change the parameters of one model to fit it? I don't know. It's a great question. I know that generically there are many ways to get an up and down shape. And I'll turn you, I'm about to show you in a moment a different kind of shape, which I know we can't get with another model, but I know at least two ways to get it. So that would say it's a little hard for me just to say, given that shape, I can immediately infer the process. These things tend to be entangled. Was it awareness? Or was it the fact that we have non-pharmaceutical interventions like a lockdown? And when people build these models and they see changes in behavior, and then they make conclusions that lockdown saved X number of lives, that's a conclusion by assuming that the change in the interactivity was driven entirely exogenously. Whereas if I say, well, there was, some of this was already going to happen, we know that people tend to be aware and then change their own behaviors. And in fact, you can see, for example, that in mask wearing data, people started to wear ma masks are effective. Mass policies have not always been shown to be effective because when you look at the data and you say, here's the date when the mass policy was set, and you say, how much change in mask wearing? People started to anticipate this before whether because they thought the policy was going to happen or because they know that they need to do it. And then on top of that, people don't always wear them the right way. 
they bore them below the nose and all sorts of ways. So then you say, well, did the policy have an effect? You don't find it a, a great impact, even if the masks themselves can have an effect. So when people make the assumption that it was all the policy, they forget that there's this other factor too. And they've probably lumped it together. So the reality is that two things I think are happening. I'm answering your question, maybe in a long-winded way, but I think I'm answering it. One is that things are happening together, and it's hard to extract both. Right? And the other is that sometimes they are, in fact, multiple mechanisms to generate similar kind of qualitative things, qualitative patterns. And I don't think we're at the point yet where we know how to absolutely identify their contributions of either. I mean, we're not quite there yet. So I would say it's a good question. But it's not yet one that I can answer. Yeah? Yeah, the heterogeneity and the behavior, both of them could be interpreted, the S square behavior instead of S, could be interpreted in the heterogeneity or a behavior. So my question would be more like there is a possibility of differentiating between the S or the S square. Yeah, so for, for that one, in terms of what is the appropriate model, so. Let's talk about kind of ultimate and proximate explanations. Yes, you can probably show, and I'm about to show you that we have evidence that these standard SIR models are not right. And when people actually want to do forecastings, they don't use them because they would never get it right, or you'd have to keep modulating things. So you can say that the effect of nonlinearity is changing, and it's not necessarily the original one. Then again, if you just keep reloading all of that into beta, you could just keep changing beta of time and incrementally just have things tracked to fit. But I would say that we, we know that it's not as simple as these beta SI kind of models. Also, any kind of social spatial structure, we expect a different nonlinearity. But I don't know then if that's the awareness driven or initial heterogeneity or both. And I can't tell that apart, which is what I'm trying to say. OK. But now that with that good question, I want to go back to something new that I want to try to introduce. If you allow me to say this is the incidence of new fatalities. You could say it's the number of new deaths per week, for example. We should think of that as delta. And we have this negative feedback. Then it's possible that instead of using the standard model, I might replace the beta SI with something like beta SI 1 plus delta over some characteristic level, again, to the k. And I'm just using this k generically whenever I want some flexibility and nonlinearities. What does this mean? It means that if there are no fatalities, I have my standard model. There's some critical awareness where public health authorities or individuals start to say, whoa, that's way too many on this weekly basis. Then you can see that starts to decrease our interactions immediately. Sorry, delta is D. Oh. D yeah. We should think of this as the number of new fatalities per week, per day, let's say per week, as being some indicator. Right? So it's not the cumulative, but it's what's going on right now. So I'm aware things are bad, and I'm aware that things are bad because I'm aware of the bad things. Right? So I'm actually using the severity part to be the indicator for what drives me, not the case part. And if you look at reactions, there's all this, they're just cases. And unfortunately, there's also so many unfortunate things. There's a lag between cases, hospitalization, and fatalities. I won't be able to explain all that today, but here I have, don't have an intermediate case. Infections become fatalities on a short time scale. It, I will explain at the end what happens when you introduce a longer time scale. So now I'm, what I'm going to do is rewrite this. And then ask, does anything new happen? Do we just get this inevitable climb? Does it just change, for example, the herd immunity threshold? Or does it change the final size or something else? So if we can rewrite this now as s dot minus beta si over 1 plus delta over delta c, some characteristic rate to the k. Remember, I'm going to call this incidence of new fatalities this delta prime. 
Okay? Everyone with me? We start off in the disease-free equilibrium. At the disease-free equilibrium, I is zero, we have delta is zero. You can begin to see that we're going to have the same takeoff problems as before. I'm not even going to kind of do that thing that I've done many times already. So now I want to know, though, if something else could happen. And the standard way that I'm interested in seeing if something else could happen is I've been setting I dot equal to zero and interpreting that value as the herd immunity threshold. Right? That the reason, the mechanism, why we have this downturn in cases is that the susceptibles have been depleted. In a behavior model, that if it's long-term awareness, then the susceptibles don't have to be depleted as much because everyone reacted. Right? And because it was a long-term kind of reaction, then effectively the beta decreased, which means we don't need to deplete the susceptibles as much to reach herd immunity. In the heterogeneity model, because of the sculpting, we also don't need to reduce the susceptibles as much because conditional upon the fact that you haven't been infected, you have a lower vulnerability. Okay? I claim, and this is going to be a, not a proof, but a claim, and you can read more, I'll put the paper which shows it, that a new thing can happen. I'm going to set I dot as zero. Okay? What happens? Beta S I over 1 plus delta over delta C to the K is gamma I. New infections balance recovery. And you can see that in the standard way of doing things, we'd erase the eyes, and we would get our herd immunity threshold. But here, we get something a little bit different. I'm going to make a different kind of claim. Instead of solving for S, I'm going to make a, a somewhat insane kind of assumption that I'm interested whether or not we can get a peak very early on in which infections stop going up, even though most people are susceptible. Everyone understand that a bit of a crazy claim? Rather than solving for S, and the, I'm going to assert that I still think S is approximately 1. OK? Should be somewhat confused, but maybe intrigued. If S is approximately 1, what that's saying if I divide by gammas that are not is 1 plus delta over delta C to the K, which means that R naught minus 1. What? Ah, yeah. Sorry. Thank you equals delta, which remember, this was gamma F I, which means that we could have a quasi-stationary state in which if we get to a point where the number of infected individuals is something like this, which means we have our number of fatalities and we have a rate of that's being generated by a certain number of infected individuals. Even if R0 is very high, if this K, if we react very strongly, this is some slight perturbation to just that value of the awareness when we start to change behavior. And if that happens, I claim, which one of these can erase? I feel like I need them all. Where can I erase something? This one I think I can erase. I claim that if I look at time, what can happen is that the disease can take off. Depending on what K is, I might get a little overshoot. But I could get I, my I signal, to look like this, where these values are very, very small compared to S. The reason why we're plateauing here is not because we've run out of susceptibles but because there's awareness of how severe it is and people take measures to reduce their interactions and you get this balance. 
This can then go on for a very long time. You can get the emergence of plateaus or shoulders rather than just single peak. Again, if I were to put this into perspective and I put S over here in one, this whole time S looks like it barely has changed. This is totally unlike the mechanism by which the reason why we get this single peak and going down is because the susceptibles now have dropped so radically and now we should see this just heading downwards. This actually was one of the most relevant and for those working in this space, the, one of the most dangerous misunderstood ideas of the early pandemic. Because, at least in my state of Georgia and many other places, there was this initial peak. It started to go down a little bit. And as I showed you yesterday, some of these models just assumed what goes up must go down. And therefore, this must be an indication that rather than this signal of susceptibles, we must have actually dropped our susceptibles enormously. How else would it go up and down? Right? That's what we expect from every other models that I've showed you already. If that were the case, there's even another thing that happens. If you think that the indications of a little bit of a drop are the signs that we've reached herd immunity, but yet we've only documented a few cases. Right? So this was happening in late April 2020 in Georgia where, and many other places where the number of cases, relatively speaking, was very low. We weren't testing. We didn't know. Yes, there were fatalities. Quite a lot in some places. But if you think that's the case, the only way to get a decline in a classic model is through susceptible depletion. So if we've only measured a half percent or one percent of the population being infected, and you see a decline and you think it's herd immunity, that means that we must be under ascertaining cases by a factor of 50 or more, maybe 50 to, to 75 or even close to 100. If we're under ascertaining cases by that much, it means that COVID is not much worse than the flu or the cold because the case fatality rate must be also divided by that ascertainment bias. Does everyone understand this sort of logic? Which was wrong, which is wrong. And it was wrong because people misunderstood the fact that diseases need not have a single peak. As soon as you go away from these classic models in which you only characterize everything by one number, R0, and maybe the speed, little r. If that's all you have, there's no behavior, there's no awareness, there's no feedback, then you would expect this to happen, and that means this is happening, right, because we've depleted the population. Whereas, if there's feedback, you can get this long plateau or shoulder. And I'll just point out, I can't do it in this class without either doing a simulation or other means, and I'm not going to turn on the computer to do it, you can imagine, of course, that this category doesn't just end up directly in this category. There's actually an exposed period. There's a hospitalization period. And this can last typically three or four weeks behind when someone is infected to where the, ultimately then we start to see the signal in fatalities. Because of that, this awareness is in some sense lagged. There's a delay in the system. And because there's a delay, it turns out, I think it's OK to erase this. You get the idea. I can just put it up here. Because there's a delay in the system, if you introduce delays, you can actually get something like that, where you end up near, if I think about now this as the deaths per day or per week, and here's my critical awareness value, here's time, you can actually get oscillations in these models. So you get a first peak and you get a second peak, and this is not because necessarily that we've depleted the susceptibles and the whole new group of susceptibles here, we've just changed our behavior. And this has happened again and again where things get better so people relax. As they relax, but it's delayed information, then things start to get worse again, then we 
start to implement measures. And I can't say necessarily that's going to keep happening vis-a-vis -vis external forces because politically there's another aspect there and that's beyond the scope. But you can see that at some point it stops becoming a public health decision. But from an individual behavior perspective, it is possible to get plateaus, shoulders, and even oscillations using this kind of mechanism. And now I want to go back to your question about different mechanisms that can generate similar qualitative effects. This is a new kind of feature that we did not see before in the other models. I can generate, let me just show you one other way to generate it though. Imagine I have a model in which I have, and I'm not even going to write equations, but I'm going to write some susceptibility distribution. And I'm going to have two processes. One, sculpting. And you know what I mean by sculpting now. It's a force of infection that is proportional to beta i epsilon. So each one of these categories gets hit by beta i epsilon. I, beta i is shared, epsilon is particular. That moves things in this direction. We didn't get this early plateau because of that. Because we just slowed everything down, but we only have one way to go. We could also add stochasticity in behavior. Meaning people might change slightly. When you change slightly what you're doing, what you end up doing is going in both directions and down. You flatten the distribution, right? Because we have some diffusion. You can imagine a diffusion operator. But what diffusion is doing is this pulls you this way. Stochasticity can resupply. That people start to randomly revert. You could also imagine some reversion or fatigue. So anything that drives you that way, stochasticity or fatigue, will resupply this higher epsilon and you could get depending on how you set things up, you could also get a plateau. So I just want to point out that there are new features here. And if we look at the levels, for example, in my state, in April 2020, our team built models of these kind of spread in our state. And we cautioned that we could be setting ourselves up for a long plateau. And that people shouldn't, as they see a peak come and pass, assume that the danger is past. In the south southeast, we have tornadoes. You probably have only seen or heard of them on Wizard of Oz, if you've ever watched that movie. They do actually go through the middle of cities. It's not just in cornfields. I mean, they can hit cities, etc. You have a notion of risk that comes and it goes. In some sense, what this model is saying is that our behavior can reduce the risk so it passes. But if we change, we pull the risk back towards us. Right? And that can happen at levels that are, have far, far lower cumulative infections than we would have expected. The susceptibles, effectively speaking, are almost everyone remains immunologically naive. That was true almost everywhere for the first peak. That was happening at levels in which the vast majority still remained. We did not yet deplete the susceptibles. We had not yet reached herd immunity in any classical sense. But we found peaks and plateaus, and then it ended up on the backside going down much more slowly than it had increased on the front side. OK? Any questions? Because in my view, that's what I wanted to say about that. This uh, plateau's behavior, did it come out th th from? This what? Sorry. This uh, plateau's behavior, did it come out from, the, uh, from taking in, into account the death rate? Or I yeah, mean, so I the, the how we, it came out. The reason why it came out is because what happens is that this force of infection is decreased by the intensity of these bad outcomes. Now, you could say you could have used a hospitalization model and replaced that, some notion of surrogate, or you could even use cases. But we, we tried to make our attention and make the death component explicit because that is really what has been driving our changes. It's the fact that there has been so many fatalities that has drawn this much attention and change. If that current value, so it is a notion of short-term awareness. So last time I talked about long-term, mm -hmm. 
This is a short-term but delayed awareness. That is the mechanism that's decreasing it, leading to the plateau. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yes, on this side, Matteo. Uh, uh, in the light of this, how should this impact the um, uh, decision-making of the alpha authorities? Because taking uh, measures and so uh, influencing their behaviors will, I mean, not taking them, we see that we'll have a lot of infections and deaths, but if we take them, we are gonna have a long plateau, and so we should keep them for a longer time. And in this model, we are now taking into account the cost of these behaviors right. and the measures that can cause more deaths because of uh, uh, economic crisis and um, uh, delayed uh, diagnosis in the hospitals and delayed surgeries. Yeah, it's a, another great question. Now, I only have a limited amount of time. Last summer, we tried to build a model which included socioeconomic costs and public health costs and say, what should people do if we care about both? So often it's presented, and here I'm presenting just one side, but you're right, it's not necessarily, it's often presented as a false dichotomy. Either we care about one or we care about the other. It's very hard to operate your business if people are sick and worried about infection. How does one reconcile it? In this model, at least, what we tried to ask to formally deal with this thing is say, what happens if we don't think everyone should have the same behavior? What happens if our policy change with your disease status? And so in March or April 2020, our group said, well, there are many people who have moved into this recovered category which at least in the short term, and now we, we recognize that the duration of that was unknown, but we had a notion that it was at least six months out, that it's possible that those individuals could start to actually do more and dilute interactions between potentially risky S and I individuals. We proposed something called shield immunity, and we talked about immunity visas rather than immunity passports, because I view them as a short-term duration rather than as a long-term duration. And when we tried to formalize this, we tried to ask the question if we balanced minimizing this while also noting that there's a cost if we don't have any interactions. And we asked an optimal control algorithm in some sense to say, what should we do? What it said is that people who are infected should isolate. People who are recovered should go out. People who are susceptible should do things depending on the state of the system. When we proposed that, there was some pushback. How could you possibly differentiate between people? Why do those people get to go out and you don't? Two years later, I mean, we're operating with green passes all the time now. And those are meant, I think, in some sense to say that we are trying, trying. I'm not saying it's optimal, and I'm not going to claim that these passes are optimal. There's some concession that we can't all do the same thing and that risks differ and that we have to balance both. That itself is a whole other lecture, so I'll have to leave it at that, and I can share a paper where we uh, talked about those issues. But again, those stop becoming just scientific issues. And the scientists, although we may propose ideas and the public health folks, then I can assure you we don't have the first seat at the table in those kind of discussions. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Good. I have about 20 minutes left, right? And so I only have about as much material as, as I've done left to tell you, so let me skip some of that material and try to focus on some of the highlights. I'm going to erase all this now and do one more thing. Okay. As I'd like to teach you one new method and one new concept that's relevant, and we can then tomorrow wrap it up. Okay. Good. So I want to go back to something that I started with at the very beginning, which are these speed-strength relationships. There's been a theme I've been returning to, which is we measure the speed, we infer the strength, 
So this is just the, I measure the cases and the exponential rate of case increase. I infer the strength, this basic reproduction number. And I predict the size. Right? And what I've gone to today is ways in which, depending on what my model is, heterogeneity and behavior, I often am doing these two of the same moves, but I have very different predictions here. Right? And just to remind everyone that there's this relationship, keep in mind that if I have i dot is equal to beta s i minus gamma i, which means initially this is just like gamma times beta over gamma minus 1 i, which means that this is r naught minus 1 over t i times i. This is the speed, which means that there's a speed strength relationship. r equals, and I'll put the Maybe the gamma back again. Actually, no, I'm going to do it this way. R naught minus 1 over Ti. I can think about it this way. Or I can think about it as that R naught is 1 plus R times Ti. I measure this. I infer a strength. You can see immediately why in my first lecture I said that given conditional upon the same data, you measured R, if the generation intervals are longer, the mean time of in, that you infect others goes up, then my strength goes up. So I see the same data. If, in fact, the disease has a longer generation interval, it has a higher R0 and therefore potentially can infect more people over the long term. OK? So we establish that relationship in this simple model. But what do I do when I have an S, E, IR model, or even an SEIRD model. And I mean the D not in the sense, not in the sense of the awareness model, but in things like Ebola, where there's actually a very strong post-death transmission route, which you may not be aware of. In other words, people who are dead at burial ceremonies is one of the major drivers of Ebola spread, because you can still be infected from the individual from uh, touching or handling a body, which is in many cultures part of death rituals, right? And burial rituals, sacred burial rituals. This is a different model. It gets complicated. What about if I were to take one of the simplest models? For SARS-CoV-2, and maybe I'll make it a little bit more complicated. We get exposed, some are asymptomatic, some are symptomatic, the asymptomatics recover, the symptomatics are one or the other. Mostly recover. Ah, this is going to get very annoying for us to sort of unpack each one of those. OK? Yes? Question? Even in the simple SIR model, when we want to estimate R0 from uh, R, we have to know Ti. So That's what I'm saying. So what I've said at the very beginning, that's why you can't actually do this unless you know this, which is why there was that identifiability problem that I showed you on day one, yeah. where you had the same R, but very different r naughts, and you can't figure it out unless you do some other epidemiological homework either because you know something about the disease or because you go back and trace individual outbreaks and figure out, this person was infected B by A. When did B come in contact with A? And the only way to figure that out is through some very detailed work. You could do uh, fitting, but you have a big identifiability problem. So yes, for emerging infectious disease, if you don't know this, you can't make the inference. All right, thanks. Absolutely. OK. So you can see we could get into all sorts of trouble. But I want to introduce one last methodological approach, which is rather than write with this explicit framework, what I'm going to write is s dot is equal to minus little i of t, i dot capital I is I, little i dot of t minus gamma i, r dot is gamma i, and I'm going to call little i the incidence. It's the new infection rate. 
capital I, I'm going to call the prevalence. How many people are infected? Okay. And I'm also going to make a further assumption that initially I'm going to assume that both little i and big i are going to be growing exponentially at some speed. Because this is, in this we've already shown, there's this instability and we expect both are going to grow. But I want to figure out what does this little incidence depend on? The incidence now is going to depend on prior infections. So I'm going to go look backwards in time and ask how many individuals were infected A ago, which is just the incidence T minus A, and multiply this by the number of new infections per time for a disease for someone who's infected A ago. And we get this recurrence relationship that the incidence now depends on incidence in the past. Okay, so this is the number of new infections caused by disease that was started, infector was started a period ago. Now I could break this down and break this into L of A and M of A. This is the probability still infectious at age A of the infection. And this is the rate of infection at age A. Right, so do I get to that age? Have I not yet recovered? How many people do I infect per unit time given them that I'm that age? Okay. I is on both sides. The reason, because the new incidence now depends upon the fact that there were people infected a little bit of go who were causing new infections. Some people were infected a long time ago causing new infections. And we have to add up all of those cohorts, which is what that integral says. I have no, I'm sorry to understand, there's no negative sign. There's I of T minus A. I'm going to make this infinite assumption. Of course, there's a time limit because we had the takeoff. This is used in standard, it's, uh, you'll see in a renewal equation framework, we're imagining in this limit of having an infinitesimal initial start so I can go back and yes, technically it would have a cutoff, but that's not gonna matter that much. We're gonna multiply something by zero at that cutoff anyway. So bear with me and, and accept that I can take this integral, otherwise a high number because you're right, Technically, we have a finite time where things took off. Mathematically, if I have an initially very small value, then it turns out anyway, when we get to these big A's, this is going to go to zero and it's going to knock it out. Okay? So, I think though, initially, we have exponentials, which means e to the r t which means 1 equals integral from 0 to infinity dA e to the minus ra n of a. Again, I don't know what this is yet. I don't know how many new individuals are typically infected by an infected individual whose age of infection is a. But if I did, and if I measured this r, this should work. Now, recall that the definition of R0 is the integral from 0 to infinity dA of N of A. The average number of new infections caused by a single infectious individual and otherwise susceptible population. But I've just defined this is the number of new infections caused by infection of AJ. If I integrate from 0 to infinity, I get the total number of infections. Which also means that we could use a normalized distribution all I'm doing is finding now the probability that an infected individual infects someone when they're AJ. This is the generation interval distribution that I keep talking about. It's just 
the number of people you infect typically at AJ normalized by the total. If I see an NA, I should just replace it by GA times whatever that number is. But that number is R0. Which means I end up getting an GA times R0, which I can move, and I get 1 over, no, this is, I can't put it down there. This is too exciting. Can't be down there. No, no, no. This over here is where I want it to go. Which means that if I replace that renewal equation, what I end up getting is 1 over R0 equals integral from 0 to infinity dA e to the minus Ra times g of A. This is simply a moment generating function. Right? If I have R is 0, I get 1. If I take the derivative of this with respect to r and then take the evaluation at r is 0, I can get the average age of my infections. And I can do this for all. So I can generate all the moments. What you can see is this, this m, if I call this moment generation function, m of negative r. Right? Where again, I'm saying that m of z is equal to integral 0 to a, dA, e, and let me just make sure I got it right, good, z, a, g of a. So I have the moment generating function. If I knew this thing, I could just calculate m of negative r and I would infer my r0. This is the new version of these speed strength relationships. Okay? So let's put this into action. Does everyone understand this mathematical formalism? I have this renewal equation and from it I can see that if this were known in advance, people keep asking me, but if you knew something about this shape already, you could observe the speed and figure out the strength. I think we're okay, and I'm also kind of building towards a near conclusion here. So let's put this into action. In the case, let's go back to my example of this single category. I have an I model where I have an exponential rate. I have my constant rate of, of recovery, which means I have an exponential period of staying there. So for example, I might say, what is my L of A? What's the probability I make it to AJ? Well, that should just be e to the minus gamma A. I, don't make me do the integral of an exponential. It's that. Which means that A0, I definitely am there. A infinity, I'm definitely not there. Which also is going to see, I'm, I don't worry so much about that top integral to infinity because I'm ha hitting this by an exponential, which is declining. But remember, the rate of infection given that A is just beta, which means that if I wanted to look at what N of A is, I would get beta e to the minus gamma a. Which means then, if I take the integral, just to make sure that we're not crazy, beta e to the minus a from 0 to infinity, you can see this is just going to pop out a beta over gamma, which means, in fact, we recover our r naught. This is the right definition. If I then were to take let me keep my renewal equation up there. If I were then to take this kind of moment generating function approach and ask the question, what is the integral from 0 to infinity? dA e to the minus Ra. And now I have to normalize. N of A is that. R0 is that, which means gamma e to the minus gamma a. That is my generation interval distribution. It's exponential. Which means uh, 1 over r0 is that, which means this, you can just see, should be something like gamma over gamma plus r. Which means that gamma plus r over gamma equals r0, 
which means R0 is 1 plus R over gamma R times T I. Miracle. I have very little time, but I didn't mess up wherever I am in my notes. Who knows? Who knows where the notes are? OK. We've used the same formalism. It turns out that there's a massive interest in figuring what the heck these values are. Because very early on, for example, we knew that there was this asymptomatic route. If a portion of the new transmissions were going through the asymptomatic route and they had a different average period of infection, this could mean the disease would have a very different outcome in terms of the strength. Why? If you're infected and you have symptoms, you probably aren't attending this class, I hope. At a certain point, you heard people cough, but at a certain point, you didn't hear people cough. However, if you felt fine, not only it's possible that you might have stayed, is elevate might have stayed higher longer for whatever reason. Maybe you had a lingering, I feel fine. But certainly the rate of infection could have been higher effectively because you have a behavioral impact. So the other point I want to make here is that this G of A is not something just associated with the etiology of the disease. In the absence of treatment, probably this is more or less the same for the same individual over time. If they were infected, probably this would be the same. This is not. This is being modulated by behavior, which means the generation interval is not something constant, which means, effectively speaking, this itself is dynamic. But even at the start, it's possible that an asymptomatic route could actually lead to a higher value because more of the disease we're running through that route, which has a higher TI. Now, I haven't explained, I won't have time. What do you do in practice? This is a very mathematically elegant thing. And if you read this paper, which I'll put out by Willinga and Lipsic, they calculate all these integrals for you. And this is used in demographics as well for age structure populations. The problem with those calculations is it seems you need to know a lot about the distribution. And if you don't know precisely what it is, how do you do this? It turns out with some colleagues, we said, let's just treat this as a gamma distribution with a mean and, and a variance. And if you do that, you can more or less approximate most of the generation intervals. And all you need to know is the mean and the variance. So if you can at least get data on mean and variances rather than the precise distribution, you can actually do these kind of calculations very early by replacing the true unknown G of A with an approximate thing that you take from data. Okay. There are some other features here, one of which is that if you have two different routes, I drew something here, two different routes, you can actually add up these things because you can see that if I have independent routes, then I'm just adding up these generation interval distributions from the two parts, but I don't, might not know how to weight them. So there becomes yet another identifiability problem. So when the field as a whole observes an R and uses this method, or even these direct methods, they are making often assumptions about generation intervals, or the routes by which the transmission takes. And the answer turns out depends strongly on those assumptions. So I thought there was one question, then I wanted to wrap up. Here in the front, I saw. Was there a question? No, not a question. OK, I saw your hand. OK. In my view, I more or less explained that now. So I just wanted to wrap things up because we're about to take a picture. Yeah. Let me just give us one or two last comments. Tomorrow morning, by tomorrow morning, please deposit using the Dropbox file request link your notebooks. This week, I've tried to introduce you the motivation behind why we should even learn any of this mathematics and some of these nonlinear dynamics. And I know as a uh, Spring College on the physical complex systems, I've tried to emphasize physical intuition and the biological mechanisms throughout and really use the nonlinear dynamics toolbox to explain things. I started with very basic concepts of speed and strength and herd immunity and final sizes, a lot of which, you know, some, for some of you may be new, some of you may have been old. 
But I hope by yesterday, through the heterogeneity, through this behavior and through these generation intervals, you have a broader view of what goes on and what goes in in terms of not only driving dynamics, but what we do in terms of inferring things that we might want to know. And my last thought here is, inferring the strength doesn't mean being passive. Often the reason why people do this is they want to reduce R0 to be less than 1 if they can figure out the contributions to it through different routes, which they're often do, using these methods to do so, they have an effort of control. So I just want to make sure I'm not leaving you with this, uh, uh, maybe even a bit of sad idea that somehow we measure observable and then we look at the inevitability, but rather these models are also helping you figure out what are the contributions to our not so that you can take action, hopefully, in a more concerted and purposeful way. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow online, and we have a picture. So thank you very much. Okay, so...